Alan's phone. Okay, I got a little message. We're being recorded. Now that we've taken care of that, then we'll proceed. Um, my name is Franz Spohn. I have done a number of webinars for Michaels in the past. Um, I started working as so many other people did during the pandemic when webinars became the way of being able to communicate when everybody was restricted. And um, I, enjoy, I enjoy doing these. Um, it gives me an opportunity to present information, but also uh, to get some kind of, uh, I don't know, communication with the people who are watching it. So if you have any questions, just ask your question in the chat room and then it will be, um, uh, yeah, we'll kind of, I'll, I'll deal with them as they come along rather than wait to the end and have a question answer period. If you see something that I'm doing that you want to get clarified, or if you want to see something again, or whatever it is, feel free to go to the chat room and ask your question or make a request to see something again. And I'm, I'm totally uh, able to continue talking and drawing and answer questions at the same time. So I think that if something pops in your mind, let's take care of it as soon as it, as, as soon as it occurs. And we can also have uh, you know, any question answer sessions at the end as well, but, you know, feel free to hit the chat room if you have a question. Um, my background uh, is pretty varied. I am very pleased with the many experiences I've had an opportunity to participate, participate in. And the reason I'm kind of giving this is a little bit of, of a preamble is so that it'll make my approach to what we're going to be doing today uh, make a little bit more sense. I've spent a lot of time teaching at a wide variety of venues from maximum security prisons to private art schools and just about every place in between. Um, I recently retired from a state university in Pennsylvania. I taught illustration and printmaking. I had a video series for kids, uh, instructional uh, series on PBS and co-hosted another one illustrated children's books. Um, you know, I've done quite a, a, a few things and have thoroughly enjoyed my art activity. So today I wanted, uh, I, I was asked and delighted to kind of deal with the notion of how do you draw for people that pretty much are really beginners. They're just starting the, um, in any number of workshops, webinars, when I've been demonstrating things, I, I, I can't tell you how many, uh, you know, adults have said, oh, I've always loved art, but, you know, I, when I was in junior or high school or high school or something like that, um, you know, my art teacher told me I was doing something wrong and, you know, it's kind of discouraged and quit. Or it's something that everybody would love to do, but they pursued other careers and, you know, maybe the career is winding down and you wish you could do something, want to get into art and stuff. And so that's how we're kind of uh, the next three classes, this class, and we have two more, one tomorrow, one on Friday, to kind of approach the notion of drawing, assuming that the people that are watching may not feel comfortable saying, I can draw. And uh, I've been drawing for a long time. Um, and so I'm, I'm quite used to it. It's second nature to me. I can't imagine what it would be like to be sitting around with a pencil or pen in my hand. So it's just an automatic thing for me to do. It's like uh, me breathing. But I know that for people that uh, are getting back to it or would like to uh, enter it, it can be a little bit intimidating. And I hope uh, by the end of today, at least, and if not in the series of the webinars we do, you'll feel very excited and very, very energized in um, pursuing your activity. And the biggest issue, I think, is that, you know, people, when you think of artists and you think of art, often you think of something that has been realistically rendered. And so that is kind of like the goal. I want to draw like, looks like a photograph. Well, that's, you know, why we have cameras. <laughs> So you don't necessarily have to do that. And I think that thinking that you have to draw something to be totally representative is, um, is not the way to approach it. I think what I try to do is get people to look inside themselves and realize that 
everybody is creative. It isn't just some kind of special quality that only a few select people have, and those are the artists because they have this special thing. Now, you may have a set of circumstances that suit, set you up so that you are able to avail yourself of your creativity, but I think everybody's creative, and I think it's important for everybody to think about that. Um, yeah, if you think about in the kitchen, a lot of people are very creative in the kitchen, very creative in, you know, crafting or in practical things like motor mechanics and sewing and stuff like that. I mean, you may be forced every day in life to some kind of a problem. And if you solve it, it's an indication that you're creative. So in drawing, it's channeling that creativity to try to express yourself through the mode of drawing so that you've accomplished your goal. And it doesn't always have to be specifically about making something look like, oh, that apple, I, it looks, I drew it so it looks like you could pick up and eat it. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but it shouldn't be the only goal in doing a drawing. I mean, there are all sorts of, of things that you can do with the drawing, and we'll get into some of that stuff in a little bit. But I really wanted, right from the beginning, to assure everybody that it's not a matter of whether you can draw something that looks super realistic. It's about whether or not you can draw something that express your energy, your personality. Uh, it, it speaks to what it is that gives you great pleasure in doing a drawing. And so for me, it I got a pretty wide range because professionally I've been asked to do a lot of things and there are different drawing styles that I might do for specific um, project that I normally would not do. Um, normally, and I'll, I'll be showing you some examples of it, I just like to, have things pop out of my head. I do a lot of drawing that of all these characters and things that are inside my head and I get them out. Uh, but I, you know, I am adept at being able to render something. And so I've had a couple of projects where I've had to draw things realistically. So over the years, I've taught myself how to do both ranges and I'll show you examples of them. But again, I can't emphasize enough that the goal is not to teach you how to do just really exquisite, realistic um, drawing. I think it's much more important to try to help you discover what it is that you want to do. And if you do want to draw something realistic, there's no reason why you can't do it. It just takes a lot of practice more than anything else. You just have to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. It isn't like somebody has a magical genetic thing, uh, predisposition to it. It's just that that level of um, observational stuff you can do really well right from the beginning if you're looking and if you have a couple of guidelines but to do something so it looks you know just like the real thing um, that takes a lot of practice uh, but I can also anything that I'm giving you in the next three sessions will be applicable to whether it's something that's very abstract something that's very whimsical or if something that is very real realistic, the, the things that we're gonna go over is um, applicable to all those things. So I think we're gonna switch the overhead uh, camera and then we'll get started with looking at the materials and looking at some examples of drawing and get into it. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, this is, uh, this is a shot of a drawing that I did when I was five years old. And so I uh, can't quite fit it all in, but you can get an idea. And it was almost like kind of paneled after a cartoon thing where somebody is standing in front of a cannon and then there's a very subtle little change there. It's lit and the cannonball comes out and then somebody goes get carried off of, of a stretcher. This is so typical of what the boys of my generation, I'm not sure, but I'm, I don't think it's changed too much. Yeah, we drew pictures of aliens, we drew pictures of monsters, there's a lot of people getting blown up, <laughs> things like that. So um, this is one of my, my you know, example of what I did when I was five or six years old. So switch 65 years or later, this is, you know, a kind of, a, a, again, another extreme. This is a, a replica of a famous drawing by Albrecht Durer of a rabbit. And Albrecht Durer, Work during the Baroque. Um, he is kind of credited for really 
getting watercolor to be uh, a major medium and is also known for his woodcuts and other graphic works. But you know, if you look at the two, you can see that there is a bit of a uh, contrast in the technique, but it's the same brain and the same you know, hand uh, that, that did both of them. This one is much more personal. You know, this one, even if I'm doing something realistic, I try to get a feeling for you know, the fact that this is a very specific rabbit, is a generic rabbit. And you know, as it turns out, it was Albert Durer's rabbit, but I stole it from him. So if you think about why you want to draw, okay, well, you might want to do, you know, I, I illustrated children's books. I um, have done, you know, any number of projects. So that can help direct what you should be working on. And again, um, for the type of thing that I like doing more than anything else, I'll show you some of it. Now, I do a lot of sketches in my sketchbook. And so this is kind of more characteristic of the type of stuff that I prefer doing. I'm doing stuff that kind of comes out of my head. Um, you know, here's a, I recently had an exhibition. So I have, um, you know, a whole kind of, comp I'll bring up a little bit closer and get out of the, so a lot of on animals and they're very um, personable. You know, it's almost like they kind of represent what humans would be doing. But on the other hand, in the same exhibition, this is a charcoal drawing of a, you know, like one of the old kind of fashion rubber squeezy toys. And then this is an oil painting of uh, two salt and pepper shak shakers inside of a sugar bowl. So even though the technique is very different, one of them is very realistic, the other is very whimsical and fantasy and totally out of my head when I drew these things, uh, the same brain has conceived of them. Because usually when I'm doing these kind of things, I pick odd objects to begin with. I'm not doing like a real fish, I'm doing a real toy that has kind of a stylization in a cartoony way. And so, you know, it was uh, a way for me to do realism, but interject my personality and my way of thinking of things into it. So again, I keep on stressing the notion of, you'll figure out the techniques, you'll figure out how to do all this stuff, but the most important thing is to try to figure out what is it about doing a drawing or later perhaps doing a, you know, pastel oil painting or something like that, uh, you know, why am I even doing it? Why does this give me such pleasure? And I'll tell you that when I get, um, you know, get just a, a real fast to go through the, the, the uh, sketchbook, here's a page that has kind of a combination of realism and my own goofy little drawings of birds and stuff. And I like doing them both. And, and so for me, I, I guess I'm a little schizophrenic in that, that. I love the challenge of doing something like this, but I really enjoy doing this. And I think part of it is that, that you know, I have kind of a humorous look of things. But again, you know, realism. And then here's a little pop-up book of, you know, one of my characters. And so again, it's just the, the point I'm trying to make is that it doesn't have to, like even within one artist, you can do a whole bunch of different things. So. Sketching for me is, uh, you know, this is a very typical page of what I do. Um, these are pen and ink, and then I'll either use a marker or a color or something like that. Uh, if I see something I really like, then I'll enhance it with colors. But, you know, my whole sketchbook is all full of these little drawings and these things. And as, again, this is what I prefer to do. Um, but I can do the other stuff as well. So again, point is everybody's creative. Everybody has potential of finding something to do. Now, as far as my influences, um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, you know, cartoons, I started off uh, copying comic strips um, and then comic books. That's how I kind of started to learn how to draw is I used to copy uh, cartoons and ca cartoon strips and then kind of uh, went through school learned a few things about techniques and stuff until I got to a point that, you know, I, I had some technical skills, but, you know, for the most part, it was on my own to decide what it is that, you know, I want to do. Okay. So. Well, 
Yeah. We are uh, loving seeing all your sketchbooks and we have kind of two, two questions that can go into one. Um, okay. One yes. is what do you prefer to sketch with um, as far as graphite white, uh, wise? And then kind of part B of that question is wood pencils versus mechanical. Okay, well, uh, we're actually, we're about ready to get into the discussion of the pencils and what makes one different than the other. So that especially in terms of a mechanical pencil and its use and uh, regular graphite, I actually, what I prefer doing is using pen and ink. I don't, uh, I don't draw it first in graphite. I go right from ink to paper. And that's why, you know, sometimes the drawing becomes a little more interesting. In fact, you know, I can grab over and pick up one of my, uh, you know, so the way that I usually do it is just think, okay, well, maybe I'm gonna draw some kind of a duck. So I'll just start immediately with uh, thinking about what I wanna do with the duck. Yeah, I, I don't want to go into a whole lot, but you know, this is yeah, you know, kind of this is the way that I, I work a lot. Um, usually a little bit smaller than this in my sketchbooks, and I'll come up with something like that, and then I'll do something else, maybe like an elephant. And I kind of like the immediacy of this. Uh, immediacy of this. It used to be I started off where I would do stuff in pencil, and then I would go over it with ink pen, but then that lost a lot of the energy and the immediacy of it. And so I just got to a point where I so used to just starting to draw without any guidelines at all. And part of it's intuitive, um, but I know that there are, uh, there are some times that I do sketch something out with a pencil and then go over it, but that's more for kind of the realistic stuff. But what I'm, you know, I just have a scrap piece of paper hanging out here. So, you know, these are just the type of things that I do to get an idea. And then once I look at something like maybe uh, this dog that's kind of whistling a tune, I might think, oh, that's really nice. And so then if it's on a bigger piece of paper, I can go over it and start scratching trees into it and all that, or I can transfer that idea. And maybe when I transfer it, I'll do it in pencil and then go over it with ink. But if I'm doing a, a pencil drawing, let's get into the pencil work now. Um, I'll just uh, start with a... <clears throat> um, I think it's really helpful to know about materials. And so I have this uh, thing from Faber-Castell that was put together, I think maybe in the 30s, maybe even in the 20s, but it kind of shows you how a pencil is made. And so what pencils are, are graphite. Okay, so this is a chunk of graphite and it's mined from the ground. It's a, you know, it's a mineral and then this is ground up and powdered. And then this is clay. And, and Faber-Castell uses real high quality clay. This is ground up. Uh, the clay is ground up. The graphite is ground up. And then it's mixed together with water. Now, if you think about pencils, uh, I'll move this for a second. All right. <clears throat> pencils come in a variety of hardnesses and softness. All right, so I just have a couple of, uh, these are the Castell 9000, they're kind of the standard. Okay, we got, if you look at the way that they're labeled, a 2B, 4B, 6B, 8B, somewhere around here I've got a 2H. So they run from 6H, which is a very hard pencil, to an 8B, which is a very soft pencil. Now, somebody had asked about using a mechanical pencil. Uh, you know, it's kind of a similar thing that you have different grades of lead, but usually those are a little bit harder. So in the old days, when they used to do drawings, uh, mechanical drawings and blueprints and stuff by hand, these, these pencils were much more popular back then. And you needed a hard pencil because if I use a template, and I use consistent pressure and I go around there, I will get a line that is, I'll bring it up a little bit higher, maybe, there we go. So it's a consistency in terms of direction. I mean, there's really no direction. 
and the value of it, the, the lightness and the darkness is controlled. It's the same, and there's no variation in that line. It's just very strictly a circular line. Now, if I'm using an 8B pencil, which is really soft, then I might press down and let up on it and press down on it, let up on it and press down a little bit on it. So this has a much more dynamic quality. And so this is much more applicable to something like a, a sketch of a person or an object or a drawing where this type of line, which is very static, it just doesn't have any variation at all. That's good for more mechanical things. So if you're trying to get, you know, the sense of the precision of the way, uh, like a piece of metal, like an engine uh, on a, in a motor, or if you're drawing a part for something, or if you're designing something that is very, um, very controlled, then you'll want to use a harder pencil and you'll maybe use templates and whatnot. Now all this kind of stuff is, you know, the drafting of stuff is done with uh, CAD programs and all that on a computer. But in the old days, it used to be hand drawn. So uh, the other advantage of a very hard pencil, let's see where did I put that. And we'll get into the hardness and softness now. So this is a two H. So this isn't even the, the hardest pencil, but, and also when you're drawing, we're not writing letters. And so sometimes for details, you can do that. But generally, if you're just kind of trying to put in some value or something, you want to hold the pencil more at the end and kind of use it. And the more you press down on it from this way, you get something dark. But if I want to do kind of like a, all right, I'm going to start with the darkest thing I can get with this pencil. And then if I let up on my pressure a little bit, then you can see that it immediately gets lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter until I hardly have anything at all. So the range of a 2H is something that's kind of like a, uh, not even a medium gray down to nothing. On the other hand, if I take my 8B pencil and I do the same thing right next to it, you can see immediately, oh, wow, look at that, you know? And then I can get a fuller range because I have more control of whether I put a lot of pressure, little pressure. So I keep on going and going and going. And I get to a point that it's almost as light as that. So for me, the way that I draw, I generally go for the softer pencils. Now, if you're like kind of sketch, sketching something out, let's say that you're gonna do an apple or something like that, then you might want really light lines as a guideline first. I just happen to have an apple right here. Imagine that. <laughs> so let's say I'm drawing this apple. And I can sketch it in. Because sometimes if you're sketching, you may not get the, the proportion quite right. And you want, might want to change it and erase it and whatnot. But then once I have that in there, then I can kind of come back and think, all right. Uh, I can put a little more in through here. I can get a little bit of uh, value on this side and I can start working with the shading. And we're gonna kind of hand go into this type of thing uh, tomorrow and on Friday, but just, you know, to kind of explain why you have different softnesses of lead, I thought it would be, you know, kind of good to, all right. So you can kind of see in that if I want to highlight something or if I really want to call attention to an edge, I can put like a darker, almost like a line in through there. And so it's gonna have a certain character with a variation of light to dark, not only in terms of the value in the shading, but also if I decide that I wanna add some kind of line to things. And you don't have to outline everything. Like I don't have to do an apple by automatically outlining the whole thing. I could leave, you know, uh, in fact, let's get rid of some of the lines here. You can get rid of all lines, and create an edge by putting in a darker background or something. So this kind of little more softer way of doing it. But at any rate, the point here is that an 8B is a really soft pencil and a 2H. Now, what happens is that when they take that lump of graphite, grind it down, the clay gets ground down, they mix these two together. And the hardness of the pencil depends on the proportion between the clay and the, the graphite. 
So for a very, very hard pencil, there's a higher proportion of clay. And in a very soft pencil, there's a very, uh, there's a much higher um, selection or percentage of the graphite. And so there are a whole bunch of like, here's a 2B, a 4B, a 6B. So you can use a 2H or an HB for light sketching. And then when you start to develop stronger lines or you wanna get shading and value, then that's when you go into it with uh, probably a, a softer pencil. Now, like on the same token, like here's a 2B. So you can see it's not as dark as that, but it's darker than that. And so that's why, you know, like in, in several of the sets that I recommended that you look at uh, to start drawing with, you know, you should have a hard pencil, a medium pencil, and a soft pencil. And in some cases, um, from my approach to drawing, I recommend, you know, really, really soft things like uh, an 8B. I love the 8B just because when you're drawing with it in, in a gestural way, you can go from thick to thin just by pressure and the motion that you're drawing with. You know, so if I'm, you know, doing some kind of a, I'll do some kind of a dog or something like that. So I get light lines, I get dark lines. Um, I can come in through here. Now, when it comes to additional shading, I can use my finger. Uh, you can also get a paper stomp, which I have floating around here someplace. Um, I got my whole tables full of stuff. So at some point I'll find it and we'll come back to it. But you can use a rag, you can use your finger. And if you're working with a soft graphite, and then um, these are needed erasers, uh, they're color erasers. You know, the only new ones that I have, but um, a regular needed eraser, the general color is more of this kind of gray. And I, I asked everybody to get one of these and a vinyl eraser, and we'll get to that in a minute about what they're used for besides just erasing. But then, you know, I can kind of come back and I can pick some of that up. And then I can come back with, uh, you know, like my really soft pencil and graphite and come in through here like, like that, maybe get some more variation. So you can see that it starts getting a little more life and a little more interesting because I have a whole variety of marks and the energy that I'm drawing with is transferred to that. Now, in the case of the more realistic things that I showed you though, this is not the way to draw. Yeah, uh, this is like the way I like to draw because I do like the energy and I like the different things that you can you can do with it very quickly and very, uh, as I said, energetically. If I'm doing something that I'm really rendering like that one fish, then I'm more apt to use the lighter pencils, the, uh, the harder pencils, sketch some things out, you know, get the general forms in, really work on the shape of it. But in all cases, whether I'm using a soft pencil or a hard pencil, I always want to use light pressure because if, if I want a dark line, I don't want to try to get it with a hard pencil because what's going to happen is that if I draw a real hard line with a hard pencil, I can try to erase it. But what I've done is I've scarred the paper. The paper uh, is also an important thing. We'll talk about that in a second. But the paper has the top grain and then it goes down to the bottom of it. So if I were to kind of come back here and go on top of that, you can see that there's a white line that starts to develop because that was like an embossed line that was created by using too much pressure on my pencil. So the paper that you work on, uh, you know, obviously I've, I've drawn on everything from napkins to notebook paper to really good sketch paper. You'll get the best results if you use good paper. So if you're working on a drawing or something that you're, you really uh, is important to you and you really want to develop into a finished piece, get a good paper. Um, and that would include, uh, you know, there are all sorts of different types. I'm using a Canson recycled uh, 
all media paper. It's got a good weight to it. Uh, it takes the medium well, and you can erase it. Uh, for the drawing of the fish, I did that on 100% rag paper. Um, you, you just want to treat yourself to good materials because if you're using um, just a regular pencil on on like printer paper, you still will be able to draw, and you know you still come up with something that could be really interesting and all of that. But you're kind of limiting the things that you can do because you won't be able to erase as well and the graphite might not stick to the paper as well and it'll be harder to build things up. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you don't want to skimp on your materials. And especially when you start out, if you have uh, bad materials and there are bad pencils out there, I mean, they really are not really good quality pencils. You're going to fight it. You know, our, uh, the Faber-Castell 6B pencil is, all quality materials, it's highly, I mean, it's really saturated with graphite and there are a lot of knockoff pencils that look similar to them. And you think, oh, I got an 8B here and you're just not getting anything because they have more filler. So you want to have um, really, really uh, as the best materials you can afford because you'll have a much more pleasurable experience doing it. And that just enhances everything. So if we go back to kind of the, the pencils and the way that they make them, all right, we, we talked about the softness and all that, but I thought it'd be interesting for you to actually see. These are uh, the wood blanks. Uh, they come from California. Uh, Faber Castell has the stand of uh, trees, cedar um, in California. They cut the trees down, they make the blanks there, and then they ship the blanks to Germany. And then they will take the blanks and they'll cut grooves in them. And then they will fill them with whatever lead they're, they're, uh, they've made. This could be a 6B, could be a 2H, whatever. And then they glue them together to make a sandwich. And that's important to, to mention. Some pencils, uh, they'll spot glue. So once these go into these slats, they'll put a little thing of glue here and here and here. Faber-Castell glues them along the whole barrel so that when everything is sandwiched together, all right, then they start milling one side. And then when they do the second side, you know, they didn't go all the way down on this side or they'd fall apart. But, you know, this is kind of what makes the pencils when they finish. And then they paint them um, and get them ready and then pre-sharpen them when they come to you. Now, the thing about gluing them on the whole side, I don't know if you've ever had a pencil that when you sharpen it, all of a sudden you get to a point and the lead comes out. And that's because at some point, like the, these are fragile. So if you drop a pencil, there's a chance that the graphite from the shock of dropping it might break. So if you have a glue spot here and a glue spot here, then what happens is that when you go to sharpen it, there's nothing holding all this lead in it. So it'll spin around or it'll keep on breaking out. So it's really good. Um, you know, they have a, I, I forget the term, but it's some kind of bonding, but essentially it's glued along the whole thing. So that if you have a break in the lead, you won't even notice it when you sharpen a pencil. The other thing that's important is that these leads should be exactly in the center because if they aren't, if they're off to one side, when you sharpen that pencil, your point will have graphite on one side and it'll have a wood you know, shield on the other. So you know, that's kind of some of the things that are the difference between a really good quality pencil and something that's you know manner manufactured and sold very cheaply. So you maybe it seems like kind of the American way a lot of times is you know spend as little money on something as possible. But when you're trying to do a pleasurable thing, it, you know, in, in an, an analogy I always used to use too is that you know if my son's going to play football, I'm not going to buy him a cardboard helmet. <laughs> you know, I want to make sure that he survives the experience. So I will buy him a good quality uh, helmet. And, you know, if the drawing is a very pleasurable, very uh, rewarding, exciting thing to do. So don't prevent, you know, 
you getting the, the, the most out of it by being handicapped by bad materials. So, you know, kind of check into things and make sure that you're getting good quality products. And just, I obviously have a bias, but I have been using Faber-Castell products for quite some time before I started working with them because I found that they really, uh, you know, they do what they're supposed to do. And instead of inhibiting you from doing your best work, you know, I've ended up doing stuff I never thought was possible just because I thought, oh, I wonder what would happen if I tried something and because they were very adaptable and they're really good quality material. And that goes for your paper, it goes for your paints, you know, whatever you're getting into once you start becoming more involved with the art world, I think it's really important that you, you know, kind of think about um, treating yourself. I mean, don't inhibit yourself. And obviously, if you're on limited budget, just get the best that you can. And don't always worry so much about, you know, nickel, dime, you know, whatever, when the quality is going to really help you do much better. Now, let's talk about some of the uh, accoutrement. So these are a variety of erasers. Um, you know, again, these, the reason I like these needed erasers is that gray is yeah, these work really well. These work equally as well, but this is yellow. <laughs> you know, this is red, this is blue. For me, I like bright colors, and so it's a little more fun for me to be using these. Now, the theory of the kneaded eraser, these are slightly sticky, okay? And so when they start in this form, uh, you just have to work them a little bit. That's why they're called, you know, it's not so much that you need eraser like it's required or it's essential that you have it which is to some extent true, but it's because you're kneading it like you would knead um, dough for bread, all right? So you get it soft, softened a little bit. And let me um, build up, let's see, where's my AP, here we go. All right, so we're gonna move this a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna just put down a little plot here. Of, graphite. And again, I'm not holding it like I'm writing a letter and really bearing down. I mean, if I know that, it's okay to have it that dark, and I don't have to worry so much about ruining the paper. I could do that, but I can get the same result this way without, and you can kind of see there's a little bit of the grain of the paper coming through. That indicates that, you know, this is a fairly smooth paper. You can get other papers that have a rougher texture, and that uh, marbling or that texture would be a little bit more pronounced because when I am using a pencil like this, I am just laying the graphite on the top surface of the paper. So if you kind of think about the paper having a grain, you know, you've got the hills and the valleys. What I'm doing is kind of building up the graphite on the top. And then you can get a little, uh, it, it kind of makes it a little illuminating, it makes it glow a little bit to get a little bit of white to show through. But if you want to make sure that that is just solid dark, you just go over and over again. And eventually you will start filling this up with the graphite without damaging the paper. You'll still have that grain. All right, so I'm gonna kind of build this up. All right, now if I were to make some real subtle change, I can take my knee erasers and instead of like rubbing going back and forth, I can pat it. And so all of a sudden it just pulls the graphite off. So in a sense it is racing, but it's more like adjusting the value. So if you have an area that you want to kind of feather into something else, you could just um, kind of roll this up, make a little bit more and just with very light pressure, you can start picking up some of that value. So you can make it lighter, but it's much more subtle, but you can press pretty hard and it'll be a lot brighter. So this could be a very interesting technique if you want to develop a sense of transparency or if you want very subtle uh, changes to everything, then you can use the knee eraser. Now, on the other hand, if you have a vinyl eraser, it's much harder. Um, yeah, you've got nice edges, script, you know, 
sharp edges. Uh, you know, eventually as you use this, you might want to trim it to get a sharper edge if you need it. But if I want to, I can use this to draw with. So it's much more uh, effective in terms of totally removing something. So let's say that I've got, now this is a graphite crayon. And these also come in uh, different hardnesses. I think the most of them are in the B range. The B, you know, like a 2B, 4B, 6B, the B uh, represents the softness and the H's are for the heart. Um, what are nice about a tool like this, you, you have a point, if you're doing a bigger drawing and you're using a pencil like this, this is a 2H, um, that's as big as the thickness of that line is gonna be. So if you're doing some big shape, Let's bring this. If you're doing some big shape, that's not going to be very dramatic because the shape that you've described in the surface area is a lot larger, and then that makes this line look a lot smaller. On the other, actually, let's use the 6B just to, so it shows up a little bit. If I do a shape that's that big, then this line, the thickness of that line, seems to work fairly well with that shape. But if I'm coming up here like that, then the thickness of that line may be a little bit inadequate to kind of fully define that shape. So if you have um, a tool like this as a graphite crayon, when I make this line, it's a lot thicker. And, and especially if you're thinking about doing gesture drawing and something much larger than working the sketchbook, then um, it's going to be much more able to, to take on the, the, the task of working with the scale. Now, the other thing about these, if you want, you can see that they are hexagonal and they have these flat shots. So if you want a thicker line, you can draw with one of those surfaces. So again, it's kind of good to know what's out there and what's available depending on what it is that you want to do so that if I want to draw, um, all right. And then I can use, and, and you also become very adept, even though it's kind of a thick line, you still can get small little details if you go off of some of the sharp edges. So I can get like a thin line using the edge. I can get a thicker line if I use the point, and the more I use the point and it wears down, the thicker the line. I can get a line with using one of the facets. And then there's always, you can get some nice shading by using the side of it. So if you're working on a larger scale, this is a very versatile tool because you can get all these different line weights, plus you can also shade it in. Okay. Hi, Fran. So, I've got one yes. of your uh, favorite questions on how to sharpen the crayon. <laughs> uh, okay. The crayon, they make a pencil sharpener that has a little hole and a big hole. So you can sharpen that. And when you get to a certain point, uh, what I do, oh, you know, like this is one of those things, hold on for one second. That's the advantage of being in my studio. For the crayon, most of the times, if I can't find a sharpener that's big enough to do it, you can just use an X-Acto knife. And I don't have one handy right now, but. Faber Castell has a real nice knife that is especially for doing this. Now, a lot of times if I'm sharpening my crayon with a knife, and what I'm doing is just using very light pressure and then just kind of going around. And essentially, I'm doing what a pencil sharpener does, but one stroke at a time instead of like shaving it off. Now, what's cool about doing this and normally what I do is have like a little paper underneath there because you can use this. This is graphite. So you can also use this if you're going to be doing kind of large areas with value. Actually, this will be good because now we can use an eraser again. 
So I've kind of spread that graphite all over as a, as a general gray field. And then we can go back into it in eraser. And that's, I'd love to wallow in graphite. <laughs> you know, it's like, I want to make sure I wash my hands before I go throughout my, my, my house. But, uh, you know, right now, it's okay. So just, you know, you can sharpen it. You get a very sharp point. Just have an exacto blade, or uh, like I said, Faber Castell makes a really nice uh, sharpener, particularly for graphite. But this is, you know, just any any sharp blade, a utility knife, exacto knife, or whatever. And so now I'm back to having a very sharp point. Now let's look at what I just did with the graphite here. An unplanned demo here. Again, you know, if I want to, I've got this field of graphite. And so it's starting to look a little bit like Pian. That's this could be Pinocchio. Let's make him really lie. <laughs> A really long nose on them this time. And then I can take my knee eraser. And if I want the light to come in this way. And so this is, you know, again, this is not a realistic drawing, but it's, it's, it's a drawing. And I find doing stuff like this a lot of fun. And then uh, we'll give them some more teeth there. A little more of a gear thing, kind of give him his hat. Now you can come back and, and refine some of that. Okay, so. To get the idea, I mean, you can actually use your waste from sharpening your crayon, you know, keep it like, and, and you know, sometimes what I'll do is have like a jar and I'll take a piece of paper, use it as a funnel and put the graphite back in there. And then you can pick that up with a tissue, your fingers, whatever, and you can use it. So in the process of sharpening your pencil, you also are, you know, kind of making a, a drawing material for something later. And this is the type of stuff that I really would encourage you to start doing is starting to play. Instead of kind of thinking about, oh, I want my work to look exactly like this. Maybe you would find that you can express yourself better in a more whimsical or abstract or energetic way. Because a lot of what this is, there's a lot of energy. I mean, you erased it and you can see that there's a lot of physicality to this and that's why it looks the way it does now if we had decided that we'd start with a 2h pencil and go all the way up to an 8b and do something like that at apple and highly render it like well here's a good example this is on um, the case of the faber castell uh, sketch set that you could also get it's got a really good range it goes from 2h to 6b it's got a sharpener and eraser in it but all these tones were very meticulously built up and in doing a drawing like that you know it's a matter of maybe sketching sketching part out with their 2h just to kind of get the shape and the other thing too is like i think that beginners a lot of times have a tendency to do what i call stutter drawing they kind of draw and draw. And so instead of kind of trying really very energetic and fluid motions, that energy is stopped up a little bit by being timid about what you're doing. So you got erasers. And if you're using a light line, let's flip over here for a minute. <clears throat> you know, if I'm trying to get a sense, let's go back to. Let's see what I got. Yeah, we'll go back to the apple again. Now, the other thing that's kind of nice about erasers, I have found that I want to, instead of me being able to see this straight on, 
and you looking at the top of it to show you a little bit more about what I'm drawing. If I make like a little ring out of my kneaded eraser, then I can kind of use that to prop that up. So now we're looking at it more uh, from a traditional angle. So I could come through here. I'm holding a pencil and I want to make a light line. So I'm just kind of seeing tentatively where that line is. So you can make a whole bunch of lines, but instead of kind of going little itchy, scratchy bits, just feel into the movement of it. All right, you want to get that to be free wheeling rather than stop, start, stop, start. And part of that is just confidence. You know, you got to think, all right, there's a good chance the first line you make is not going to be correct, but that's why you make all these other lines. And in these series of lines, you'll start to pick out the form that is more consistent with you want here. Now we're getting into a little bit more of what we're going to be discussing later, but if you think about, you know, this as a sphere, then, and it's, let's say it's, it's um, invisible, or, or let's say you can see through it. If you think about, you know, if I cut that apple, in half, you'll get something that looks slightly like a heart. But when you look at it all together, you don't really see that, but there is a depression in here. So we'll kind of indicate where that is. And then kind of put like a, a little line of symmetry here. And then I think about this part, there is part of that apple that kind of comes like this. And then as it gets in through here, it goes like that. So this is kind of like, if I cut it, this way, you know, like the core would be here. This is the shape that you would get. And that's another thing that, you know, we're going to get to tomorrow is kind of talk about different things. But when you're thinking about the way something that's, that's built up, like even something like um, this spaceman that I just happen to have right here, I can look at him in terms of basic shapes. And again, this is where sketching comes in. And I usually sketch like a 2B. I think um, a, the 2H is just to me still too hard. Um, but other people, if you're doing really, really tightly rendered stuff, they'll go with it. But a 2B, HB is pretty good for this. But if I analyze, let's say, his head or something, there's like kind of this round shape for his head. And then I can kind of show where the eyes would be. And then the nose would come here like that. So when I sketch stuff out, I start kind of looking to see how I want to divide it up. Now he's got these kind of earphone things here. There's another one in through here. I can see a little, little bit on the top. He's got this kind of little cap and he's got these little, you know, the line of symmetry comes like that. So on top of that cap, I got a smaller shape. And so I'm breaking this up into little shapes, but my lines are sketchy, but they're not scratchy. <laughs> they're, they're fluid. You know, I keep my hand moving. Uh, the energy is fluid rather than stop, start, stop, start. And I think that if you get used to sketching in a more fluid way, and again, you know, if you do something that's way off, that's what you have your eraser for. So, you know, if you do light lines, you know, you could, you could get rid of the entire thing or leave just enough as a guide of what you did before and use that to build on the next one. So again, that's, you know, one of the reasons it's good to know about the qualities of your materials. So you know that for sketching, you might want to use um, a soft one, but one that isn't as soft as an 8B. Uh, it's very erasable. And then when you start thinking about blocking in the shading for it, you can do the same thing. You can kind of very quickly put it in, in a preliminary way, if you want, you know, something that's a little more energetic, or if you want to build it so it's really photographic, then you start building those areas up lightly and generally get the whole thing, uh, the, the lightest value in first. Then you go into other areas and put a little bit more, and you put a little bit more, and you build these up gradually and get these things so that they're seamless and you don't see any strokes or any hand evidence at all. But again, for me, you know, just the way that I naturally draw, it's much more a combination of, you know, these kind of lines and things like that. But it's up to you to decide. So, oh, yeah, another thing <clears throat> I thought was interesting 
All right, this, this is, um, again, what I'm talking about for me, and this is not necessarily something for you. I just found some pieces of uh, scrap paper where I was just kind of playing around with a pencil. And so again, this is, this is the way that, that I draw because again, I'm coming up with, I start drawing something, I might say, okay, I'm gonna do a duck, but I never know until after I draw it what that duck's gonna look like. I was doing a series of elephants, angry elephants, um, odd people, monkeys, you know, try to experiment with getting, you know, movements that they aren't all static, different weird poses and stuff like that. We'll get into that like in, in step three. Um, there's a pig, I was drawing a pig in lederhosen. Um, but the character of all this stuff is different line weights. Um, I just noticed somebody put in, I think softer would be easier. I totally agree. I think that, um, if I had one pencil that I had to pick to use, I couldn't use anything else, I'd always get the 8B because it, it gives you the opportunity to be able to draw light sketchy lines as well as, you know, really dark lines. And it also, my style of drawing it's important to try to like, you know, if I take something and go like that, the energy it goes from thick to thin. And so if you have somebody's shoulder, let's say, when you come across with a thick, dark line, like I'm, I'm you know, really emphasizing, and then it kind of goes into a thinner line, goes thick again, that gives it a much more organic feel because usually with an organic form, you don't have, I mean, you, you definitely can see an edge, but you don't see a line. So if you are using line to represent something that's organic, if you can vary the line from light and thin to thick and dark, that really gives the feeling that not only does that describe the shoulder, but it kind of implies that that shoulder rounds over to the back. And so again, these little, little hints that can, you know, if you want your object to have a little more weight, not necessarily that it's realistic, but if you want to have more weight, then experimenting with the way that you make those lines is pretty important. So I think that, you know, it, it, one of the, the, the things that I would recommend doing is, you know, getting your pencils, uh, whatever it is that you've got. Um, now, oh, the other thing I, I keep on forgetting to mention, when you sharpen your pencil, use a hand sharpener. And you can use uh, like this set, that I think was one of the, you know, this is just like the basic set. You've got, um, you know, three, three pencils, 2B, B, and HB. The thing that, that is lacking here is like a really soft, like an 8B, but you certainly can get, you know, good results using this. But, you know, you've got a one hole pencil sharpener. Um, you know, I had floating around here. This usually happens when I do, a, oh, I have my hand. I have one for a big pencil, one for a small pencil. You know, don't make it, but what's important about using a hand sharpener as opposed to like a mechanical one for an office pencil, like a two, the 2B pencil that you have that's used for at schools and, you know, doing test score, all that kind of stuff, it's made for longevity. It's made so that, you know, you're holding it like you're writing a letter and you're doing, you know, figures, you're adding whatever. You want a pencil, the point that's going to stay sharp. You're not looking for variations. You're not looking for a real dark. You're not, you just want graphite to put letters and numbers down. And so they have much, like a number two pencil is not the same as a 2B pencil. And the graphite is not as quality in an office pencil as in a, a drawing pencil. And so you can afford, like if you think about the point of um, an office pencil, yeah, you know, it's kind of like this, where the height compared to the width is a certain proportion. Well, with a graphite, a drawing pencil, I'm gonna, you know, kind of, over over uh, emphasize this. It's more like this shape, where the proportion from the height to the base 
is a little bit different than here. This is much more elongated. So the slope of this side that you get with an office pencil sharpener is not quite that this is a little blunter. It's more like a golf pencil. And that's because the wider, since this is a softer graphite, since this is softer lead in the pencil, it's going to break a lot easier. So these pencils are much harder and so they can uh, be sharpened so that they're more like this and the point will last longer. If you have that kind of point on uh, a drawing pencil, the first time you go to draw, that point's going to break and it's going to go through and you know, go flying through the air. Now, a color pencil is even more so. You can get uh, pencil sharpeners that look like they have the two same size of hole, but the blade is set at a different angle. And so for color pencils, they're even more squat because the lead in a color pencil is even more soft than in a graphite. So <clears throat> the blade set here so that you're not gonna get the same, quite the same type of point that you do with a automatic electric sharpener. So, um, you know, just get used to sharpen your, I mean, it seems like, oh, well, you know, I'm going backwards using a hand sharpener. Now, this is much better for your pencil to use this because it's set in a way, and it also is a little bit gent gentler sometimes with an office, you know, it, it kind of grinds them rather than, than uh, sharpen them. And, and you'll get the pencil will last a lot longer if you hand sharpen them with, with you know, like a, a handheld sharpen. Okay, so, uh, you know, as far as erasers, um, you know, we kind of talked about the meaty erasers and the vinyl eraser. This is for heavy duty stuff. We're making really dramatic changes. Oh, and then, with a knee eraser, you can see it's already gotten you know full of all that graphite. So to use it next time, what I'll do is knead it. And what happens is that magically, <laughs> who knows where the graphite goes? It's almost like it's a magic trip. Eventually, you know, you'll really saturate, but now this is nice and clean or clean enough that you know, if I use it instead of depositing graphite, I'll pick it up and it's still very you know, it's sticky enough. Okay. Now there are other, you know, I just noticed somebody asked about a pink pearl. Pink pearl's a good eraser. It, it would be comparable more, you know, to this type of, of eraser. Um, the neat eraser is pretty much a, a distinct animal compared to a harder eraser. So the vinyl eraser is good. These are made so that um, as you, erase on them, you can see you get a couple little little shreds and stuff. It's, it's effective in hardcore erasing, but it's a little more gentle on the paper. Sometimes um, a pink pearl, especially if they've been around a little bit, get kind of hard, might actually damage the paper a little bit. Vinyl eraser stays softer a little bit longer, but you know, a pink pearl certainly would, would work. All right, so he races, but then they also, yes? That is time, but I would like to invite everybody tomorrow to oh, come yes. with your questions. <laughs> yes, I didn't, I didn't have a clock going, so I, I, you know, I could be here for another two hours if anybody, you know. <laughs> so yeah, tomorrow, so. tomorrow uh -huh. what we'll do is go over um, methods of creating space and how you can start putting your, image together and beginning of approaches to drawing. And then the third session, we'll really get into depth of drawing one object and try to kind of develop it far enough along how you can see all this various information will combine into one thing. So I hope to see everybody tomorrow. Okay, everybody, uh, get your pencils out and start playing.